a virus, a mental virus, which these include Aristotle's works. And Aristotle and Plato are opposed to one another. Uh, for example, with regard to the soul. For Plato, our souls are the main part of us. It's eternal. The main point of life is for us to make sure that we're protecting our soul, which doesn't want to do anything with the physical world. The physical world is corrupting and corrupts our souls, so we want that aesthetic uh, uh, soul free from corruption. And so you try to avoid attachment to physical things. Remember, that's the same with Buddhism. I think I, idealistic uh, Confucianism as well. Uh, so, so that's the axial age. The religions from the axial age are going to be like that. But Aristotle is physical. Everything is in this world. Your soul is part of your body, and your body ceases to move. That's pretty much the end of the soul. So if you're going to live for your future, you want that future to be now. You want to have a good time now. You want to have good things now. You want to have good friends now. Good, you know, everything you're focusing on here and now. Not uh, avoiding all of that stuff so that your soul, which he doesn't think exists, right? So why? Why worry about that? Uh, that's fake. Don't even think about it. Uh, that's, it's a fiction. Okay? But instead the focus is on the here and now. And think about that when it comes back into Europe and starts persuading people. Do you think that's going to have an impact on the church? Yes. It certainly does. And by the way, that wasn't the only route. It, it also came into Europe through the universities in Spain, which, remember, they were run by the Islamists uh, that lived in Spain until um, the Spaniards under El Cid chased them out, right? The Moors chased them out and then basically transformed society and said, no more wokeness. No, no more putting up with other cultures and letting people uh, do you know, their different things. Everybody has to be Catholic now or else. Uh, that's better, you know. And so, so, but while the universities were there, that information, of course, uh, also you know, trickled up into Northern Europe. So what we end up with around uh, 1100, 1200, 1300 is a transformation of uh, the thinking in Northern Europe that added Aristotle. And in fact, they started referring to Aristotle as the philosopher. No one else. Because as far as they were concerned, Aristotle knew everything. We didn't know about all this stuff, but now that we have the books, and more and more of the books come in, and they get translated, and as they get translated, every, everybody uh, you know, starts becoming an Aristotelian which, of course, creates all kinds of problems for the church. Uh, it causes the Reformation, actually. Uh, so when you see the earlier reformers, they're reforming uh, because they don't accept the new theology that's a result of the merger of the church theology with Aristotle. And so you end up with this, this, this you know, transformation uh, theologically. Um, and by the way, then comes along the scientific revolution uh, which results because now that Aristotle's back and people have had hundreds of years of doing logic, they apply the in advanced logic skills to the new uh, uh, incoming books of Aristotle, and you end up then with uh, people realizing that Aristotle was wrong about a lot of things. And that's very upsetting, because by then the church had adopted Aristotle, and it was really annoying to have someone criticizing Aristotle, like Galileo, for example. Gravity, you know. Aristotle thought things naturally fell to the place where they wanted to be. And in fact, that one specific uh, example was that um, the... Uh, heaviest thing falls faster than lighter thing. But that's actually not true. Um, and we have a demonstration of that. Let's see if I can find it. Um, Thanks. 
three hours or apparently eight hundred thousand feet. So three, five, four, number one, two, one, three. Bowling ball on a feather. Falling in a vacuum. I wish they didn't actually slow it down. Would have been neater seeing it fall. Because you know it's falling as fast as the bowling ball. Do you know how it's like once it gets close to the fire? No. I was about to say if you did, you could just speed it up and see. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so <laughs> so Galileo was right, and that proves that Aristotle was wrong. So, there, there, of course, Galileo couldn't have done that experiment because he didn't have the huge vacuum uh, uh, that you know they use for space studies. And things. Um, but in any case, uh, what I wanted to try to show was the impact of Aristotle on all. Uh, even Europe, even though it, it took a while for it to come back to Europe, um, was the belief that all knowledge has already been figured out. You need to find out something, just read Aristotle. He knows everything. So it's, it's like nobody has to do new studies or new science to find out anything. All you have to do is know where to go in the library to read what Aristotle said. And there it is. You're all done. Study Aristotle. And that's everything. Pretty amazing, considering. Um, so that was that was impressive if you think about it. That this guy has created such a, a, a system of knowledge. But by the time you get to Kant, there are all kinds of problems. And so when Kant comes up with his uh, uh, categories, you end up with twelve. Twelve categories instead of ten, um, and you get quantity broken up into these three, quality broken up into these three, relations broken up into these three, and modality uh, broken up into those. So there will be a, a shift at that time. So you'll see why when uh, we're doing Kant, why Kant is so significant. Everything, everyone today in the Western world is considered to be at least a Kantian. So, so if, you, if you're, you're not in agreement with Kant's philosophy, you haven't had enough education yet. Go back to school. Um, but after that, then you end up with a couple of splits, which is kind of interesting, which we'll cover as we get to those. Um, OK, so. Pretty interesting stuff. But by the way, his writing is dense. I, I love the way the biologist says it's dense, it's impenetrable, etc. Uh, and yet it's magnificent, as he says. Right? And uh, why is it magnificent? Because it says everything. He turns out he's wrong about a lot of things. And, and that became what was called the scientific revolution. You probably have heard of it called that, right? The scientific revolution was a revolution against the science of Aristotle. So that's kind of amazing, right? Um, so he, he had come back uh, and was uh, um, so important that when they began doing experiments and realizing some of the things, the important things he said were wrong, that created a scientific revolution because now individuals wanted to go out and find out what else was he wrong about. We don't know everything. We thought we did, but now we know that he was wrong about a great many things. Sorry I sound like the emperor. Star Wars. try to imitate the emperor. Uh, shoot, then I got lost. Where was I? It was, this is important stuff, obviously. It's, oh, that's Snape. Sorry. Ah. All these memes just, you know, they take over. And what do you do with them? 
Um, let's talk about ethics. Is that our, that's our, our, our next suggested reading. Uh, so obviously we have the metaphysics. Um, notice it's a whole book. Um, I don't think anybody ever gets to the kinds of things he talks about in the back, but uh, that's important. But if we want to think about the ethics, there's two books on ethics, but the one uh, that everyone really tries to read for him is the Nicomachean Ethics. And he starts off talking about the nature of the good. Remember with Plato, they're trying to figure out what these words mean. So their dialogues are definitional. You know, what is virtue? Arete. Uh, so what kind of virtues are there? Etc. But what is the good? What is the pious? Part of what gets Socrates in trouble, not being pious. Right? Um, for Plato, you get this ideal good which we might also associate with the concept of God. Right? That you know, there's just the one good. And out of that we get all these things that we think of as good. And so the Platonists are trying to figure out, so what is it in this that makes it good? What is it in this that makes it good? And they're trying to figure out what this good characteristic is that they all have in common. And they can't quite do it. And they figure, well, that's because my soul is corrupted by my body. I can't understand it until I'm free from this prison house of the soul. Yes. So they're trying to categorize things that they see into the form of good. Yes. Which is a teleological argument. Explaining phenomena for the purposes that it serves rather than the causes from which yes. it arrives. Whereas Aristotle is like more of a empiricist, obviously, so he is like it's interesting though because of course he is a student of Plato yeah. and, and so there's a tremendous impact on, on Plato on Aristotle like you know, all men by nature loves to know well that's a platonic feeling right and it, it makes you feel like you know the only life for a human is one of study and learning and so on uh, that Aristotle, of course, spent his life doing, right? Um, but yes, it is a very different attempt to understand things. Plato uses discourse, you know, the dialogue, to try to figure out what is the good. Aristotle comes along and says, no, every art and every inquiry has its own good. Well, we're talking about good pizza. Well, there's a certain, you know, we, we love good pizza. Well, maybe you don't. I don't know if you like pizza or not. Um, I can't stand Moose's Tooth Pizza. What on earth are they doing? They're putting the kitchen sink and everything else in a pizza. You go in and they ask for a pizza and they look at the ingredients and you think, that's not a pizza. You can't put cucumbers on a pizza. Sorry. Another TV show. But you get the idea, you know. Not everybody likes the same things on pizza. What things do you like on pizza? What is a good wife? <coughs> wow, am I allowed to even ask that today? Interesting question. Hmm. That some some males might be. By the way, I highly recommend young males find the smartest woman that will marry them and marry them. And then do what they tell you to do. Because women are much smarter than guys. And they're much more focused on what we need, you know, for the future and so on. So you know, males that marry and stay married are much better off uh, than uh, etc. Right? And by the way, I have a fascinating person who argues for this. the way it's titled The State of White America because an earlier book he wrote 
uh, co-wrote with Hernstein was called The Bell Curve, and there was one chapter with one paragraph that especially bothered a whole lot of people uh, where they argued that he was a